as folks are joining, this will hopefully be the only time you hear my voice um, because our awesome youth are going to be leading the webinar. But I just want to say I'm Madeline Parker, the Youth Climate Justice Organizer in Sue Warren, um, and bounce it really quickly to Kim and Jordan too, um, so we can give our brief introductions before we hand it off to the youth to lead you through this great webinar that they've created. Um, so make sure that you're on mute um, as you enter uh, the webinar virtual room um, and we'll get started in just one minute. Hey y'all, uh, this is Kim Porter and I'm one of the uh, organizers, senior organizers for NC. I'm also um, the Poor People's Campaign, uh, Ecological Devastation Care, Environmental Chair for North Carolina LACP. Just want to say hello and thank everybody for being here. And we're so glad to have our NC Warren youth, our NC Warren member leading climate justice webinar today. And thank you all for being here. Hey folks, my name is Jordan Revels. I use the pronouns he, they, them. And I'm also working with NC Warren as a climate justice organizer in uh, Eastern North Carolina. I'm really glad to have all y'all on today and I'm looking really forward to seeing the presentation that our youth have. And we are just giving it till 2.33 and then Izzy will start us off. Cool. Um, all right, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Izzy and I use she, her pronouns. Um, so as we're sort of settling in here, um, we would love for you guys to sort of introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, so if you could drop your name um, and your pronouns, um, an organization or a group that you are a part of, um, if that's relevant. Um, whether you're a student or youth or not, uh, the city you live in, and then um, one word to either describe yourself or how you are feeling today. Um, and then, Madeline, would you push the slide, please? Um, yeah, so as you guys start doing that, um, it's great to virtually see all of you and meet you. Um, this webinar is gonna be led by the NC Warren Youth Summer Series. Um, we're a group ages 14 to 19, and we've been engaged with NC Warren for the past couple months, um, learning about climate justice and organizing this webinar. Um, we're going to be talking about what climate justice is, um, what it looks like, and actions that we can take. Um, so everyone who is facilitating this afternoon has two stars next to their name. Um, if you have any questions or comments while we're in this main section, um, please drop them in the chat, uh, you know, talk to each other in the chat. Uh, we love to see that being used. Um, also, if you're having any technical issues, uh, let us know in the chat as well, and we will address it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if, if people could start dropping the chat box for introductions, and we will get to know each other.
Awesome. Um, yeah, so keep those rolling in. Uh, love to see it, and we'll keep reading those. Um, but for now, I will pass it over to Amani. Hello, my name's Amani, she, her pronouns. And um, I just wanted to talk to you guys today to see um, if you have heard about climate justice and uh, where you heard about it from. So in the chat box, just do one through five, one being uh, like you haven't heard about it and five, three, three being somewhat and five being you've heard about it. So just state where you heard about it and what number. And very, very quickly, of course, there's always some sort of tech issue on one of these, would be a webinar without it. Um, my Zoom is telling me that my poll function is not going to work. So we were going to have this as a, a poll that popped up, but Amani will just be able to lead through it with the chat box. So thanks, y'all. Wait, I actually didn't get the working now. Oh. Can someone else do I mean, it's not letting me do it. If someone else who's a co-host, one of our co-hosts, um, can click on the poll. Yeah, yeah the, poll, right the poll popped up for me, too. Oh, OK. That's just a tech issue on my part. <laughs> no worries, then. It's all good. So, hey, this is Kim. While people are filling those out, I just wanted to mention, if you need to take a break during this webinar, feel free to, um, you know, use the restroom, get a snack, whatever you need to do, that's fine. Um, and again, we're glad that you're here joining us. If you have a, a real pressing question, you can put it in the chat. Um, hopefully, we'll have time at the end for a couple questions. And thank you. I think maybe whoever started the poll has to close it, I think. If you're having problems using the poll, um, if you want to put your, it should pop up for you, but if it doesn't, you can put your name and email in the chat and we can contact you later if you want. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's literally just on my end. It didn't pop up for me, so I'm just going to be quiet. I just know polls won't work for me while I'm doing this. That's fine. Like I said, no problem. Just put it in the chat box, put your name and email if you want, and we can contact you or phone number if you want to do that. No big deal. But I think it's popping up for most people. All right, let's move on. Thanks. Hello, my name is Tiamaka Mezzi and I use she, her pronouns. Welcome to our webinar. For this webinar, we wanna make sure that everyone is being respectful to each other. So here are some rules that we would like to uphold during this time. We have step up, step back, meaning we have to remember that this webinar is by youth, for youth. So we wanna make sure that our voices of youth are amplified. So if you're an older person, make sure that you are giving space for younger people to speak. Next, respect everyone's experience and opinions. 
Please keep in mind that not everyone will have the same experience or amount of knowledge that you do when it comes to climate change. So please remain judgment free and respect everyone's knowledge and opinions. Don't talk while others are talking and mute yourself when you aren't speaking. Background noise can cause distractions and keep us from listening to what people have to say. So we ask that you please mute yourself when you aren't currently speaking so there isn't any distractions. Also use the chat box when you're in the back when you're in the breakout room to allow you to communicate easily. Now, please enjoy this webinar and I'll pass it to Mita to talk about climate change versus climate justice. Um, so my name is Mita, I use they, them pronouns. Um, climate change is only a fraction of the climate crisis um, that we're going through. So climate change is a word that is used strictly to describe the scientific and technical changes that the earth is going through. So like rising seas, stronger storms, um, change in, changes in rainfall patterns and seasons, stuff like that. Um, climate justice is different because instead of focusing on um, the really scientific terms, it, ter it um, talks about how these shifts will affect everyday people and the lives of the everyday people and exacerbate already existing um, racial and income disparities. Groups that are facing most of the consequences of climate change, so low-income neighborhoods, native reservations, and communities of color, are often not to blame for the pollution and greed that caused climate change um, in the first place. Donna Chavis of the Red-Tailed Hawk Collective, um, who is also Lumby, said that it feels like much of eastern North Carolina has been stuck in a constant state of emergency and recovery due to multiple record-breaking hurricanes. Can you imagine what it feels like to hear scientists warn, warn that it's going to get even worse? Um, so with the frequency of, of, with the frequency and strength of storms increasing, communities that don't have that many resources to begin with are going to have to spend time and money um, cleaning up after natural disasters, dealing with like the realities of displaced families, and also rebuilding infrastructure. And that's obviously really stressful and is going to put even more of a strain on already disadvantaged areas. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Valerie. Uh, hello, my name is Uh, hello, my name is Valerie. Um, so I'm talking about why climate, about climate justice and how it intersects with other movements. So we already know climate justice is a threat to the health of humanity as well as our planet. Um, the effects of climate change are not colorblind and there is a need to consider the totality of inequities and racial justice is a precondition. So going off of first thing, uh, climate activism groups can be exclusionary and they can only tend to focus on um, the way different climate um, issues affect more um, upper class uh, populations. Um, an example of this is lobbying to pass uh, climate justice Acts uh, lobbying can be exclusionary in the fact that people who have more time and money are more likely to lobby to pass what they believe in, um, giving them more political freedom than other people. And since the effects of climate change are not colorblind, as in um, affecting lower income communities when waste is dumped onto them or uh, companies take advantage of them and try, like for example, Duke um, running the, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, uh, trying to run it through different communities. Um, and this is all important because um, climate justice groups and other movements should be considering all of these inequities that face people uh, when advocating for human rights, um, political or environmental rights for everyone and understanding that everyone is affected by climate change um, and dis and more groups are disproportionately affected like minority groups. 
um, which is the reason racial justice is a precondition. Thank you. Um, now I will pass it off to, no, now it is breakout rooms. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Hi, I'm Shay, and my pronouns are she, hers, hers. And I'm gonna talk about briefly about the history of the environmental justice movement. So the origin or birthplace of the environmental justice movement is protests that occurred in Warren County, North Carolina in 1982. So what happened is that in 1978, a trucking company illegally dumped PCP contaminated liquids along the roads of 14 North Carolina counties. PCPs are man-made chemicals that at high levels are carcinogens, can cause birth defects, and can cause harm to the liver and people. And so in response to this illegal act, the state purchased land from a Warren County farmer in order to build a landfill to bury the toxic waste in. And local civil rights activists and residents thus protested the landfill and they were joined by lots of national groups. So they were protesting the landfill because they thought it would damage their local economy's development, it would damage their, and they were sure that their objections were heard since the community did not have much power over this decision. And it's important to note, the county also had the highest percentage of African American residents in the state and was one of the poorest, which would have played a role in their decision of where to create the landfill. So the impact of these protests in Warren County is what sparked the environmental justice movement. Because what is different about than other environment related protests is that it was not isolated in just the Warren County community, but it was a national protest with communities all across the country seeking not only environmental protection, but also social. Here are protesters sitting in. And so these protests were the first time that opponents of a hazardous waste facility were apprehended for civil disobedience. The landfill was a clear case of environmental racism and it sparked change in the way that the public thinks about environmental issues. Next slide, please. So many studies were made, such as the one by Congress's General Accounting Office in 1983, shortly after the Warren County protests that further proved environmental racism. Uh, the United of Christ study that found that due to the strong statistical correlation between race and the location of hazardous waste sites, the siting of these facilities and communities of color was no accident, but rather the intentional result of local, state, and federal land use policies. So these studies found that pollution produ producing facilities like the landfill built in Warren County are for communities of color because it was easier to site them in low income African American and Latino communities than in white middle to upper class communities, which is unjust. Next, next slide, please. In October 1991, the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit met with hundreds of environmental justice leaders from the United States, Canada, Central America, and elsewhere. The summit established the principles of environmental justice and the call to action, which are two very foundational documents for the movement. The summit was also evident that environmental justice was entering the American mainstream. Next slide, please. Since the protests in Warren County, Many environmental justice grassroots groups have formed and have also been supported by traditional environmental. The EPA has also created groups with its department dedicated to environmental justice. And the environmental fight continues today as an important effort to improve and preserve a clean and healthy environment. And with that, I will pass it on to talk about recent climate topics in North Carolina. Hi, I'm Ainsley. I she her, her pronouns. Um, I'm going to be speaking about concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. Um, CAFOs are intensive feeding and housing systems for animals like swine, cattle, and chickens. And while CAFOs are extremely inhumane, the animals there are physically abused, raised in dirty close quarters, and aren't fed properly. CAFOs also have major environmental and human health ramifications. And of course, the heavy fossil fuel use 
involved in the CAFO industry contributes to climate change. In North Carolina, the majority of CAFOs are swine based and are known as hog farms. The red dots on the map of North Carolina shown on the slide indicate the locations of active hog operations. The majority are in rural Eastern North Carolina, concentrated disproportionately where there are low income communities and where African American uh, communities of color and indigenous communities exist. And this is an issue for many reasons, but the main problem is that since these hog operations are being intentionally placed near communities of color, the health and well-being of the people living there in those communities are greatly threatened. CAFOs are essentially breeding grounds for bacteria, so diseases can spread quickly to workers there and become airborne, traveling to outside communities. Also, antibiotics are commonly overused in CAFO facilities, which contributes to producing antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and so those superbugs are an even greater cause for concern when it comes to human health. Environmental regulations around hog farms are unfortunately sparse and not strict enough. And it seems like our government officials are more in support of progressing the hog industry in North Carolina rather than combating the direct toll on human health that it takes. And we can go to the next slide. According to a study from 2018 in the North Carolina Medical Journal, people living near hog farms had lower life expectancies and higher rates of hospital admissions than other North Carolinians. The pictures you see on this slide are of hog waste lagoons. Hog farms produce large amounts of waste, hundreds of millions of tons per year, and this waste is mixed with water and it's stored in lagoons. Hurricanes, which become more severe and frequent as climate change progresses, can cause an overflow of these hog waste lagoons, subsequently carrying bacteria into water sources like groundwater, which wells draw from, and these wells are used a lot in rural communities, making residents more susceptible to illness because they could literally be drinking contaminated water. And the smells from the lagoons also contributes to health issues like headaches and nausea. Passing it over to Mia. Hi, my name is Mia. I go by she, her, and I wanted to talk about the coal ash and Duke Energy monopoly. So the first thing that we need to talk about is why coal ash is dangerous. Um, and it's dangerous because if it leaks into waterways and drinking wells, it is really toxic because it has um, many different minerals like lead and mercury. And these kind of toxins um, can lead to like life threatening diseases. Um, so in North Carolina, there are about over 20,000 uh, people of color who are located near ash dumps. And there are 80,000 North Carolinians that live two miles close to an ash dump that are um, rated as like high hazard. And we have 29 dumps that are rated that way by the EPA. Um, toxic ash, um, toxic coal ash affects poor communities across the United States um, to the point that like 70% of coal ash dumps are located where household income is below the national medium. And um, these, and in these same areas, they have less access to health care, education, and voting rights. And in North Carolina, um, a case where the reason why uh, these coal ash dumps are dangerous is because in 2014, a pipe underneath um, uh, Duke Energy coal ash pond in Eden, North Carolina broke, spilling tons of toxic ash into the Dan River. And um, and there have been several lawsuits following that to uh, hold Duke Energy accountable. There was a lawsuit in January 2020 that wanted uh, Duke to excavate uh, all the wet ash areas that were unlined, which is about over 79 mil million tons of coal ash. Uh, and so Duke is supposed to pay for all of the um, damages and to clean up these communities that it affects. But what Duke Energy wants is they want the ratepayers, which is also the customers of utility, to pay for the cleanup. Um, why this is such a big deal in North Carolina is because Duke Energy is such a huge monopoly um, that over 90% of North Carolinians rely on Duke Energy for their electricity. So because they're so big, they can get away with what um, with whatever they want in the sense that 
they don't have to take full responsibility for cleanup and um also they um they can purposefully build coal ash dumps near communities with low income because they assume that these communities can't fight back and that they're weaker and it's easier and cheaper to build there um there's still hope though uh to fight against coal ash and the duke monopoly because there are many different um organizations in north carolina that purposely attack Duke Energy, um, like um, the Down East Coal Ash Coalition uh, that is uh, led by Bobby Jones. And now I'm going to pass it on to Kayla. I am Kayla and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm going to talk a little bit about fracked gas pipelines and the recent defeat of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, also called ACP, that was supposed to be built through Eastern North Carolina. So energy pipelines are pipes that carry fresh gas across long distances and they will start where the gas is extracted from the ground and will travel to areas where energy is needed, usually passing through low income and BIPOC communities. Fresh gas is primarily methane, a gas that is 86 to 100 times better at trapping heat in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So experts warn that electricity produce, produced by fracked gas is actually worse than the combustion of coal because of the leakage and venting of methane. Um, the leakage is uh, the leakage of methane is the gas entering the atmosphere or water supply before it is used to make electricity and venting is intentionally releasing methane into the atmosphere to dispose of undesired gases that are no longer useful in the process of making electricity from the ACP. And you can switch the slide now. Um, the ACP was a fracked gas energy pipeline designed by Duke Energy and Dominion Energy, and it was supposed to be a 600 mile Atlantic, or sorry, <laughs> 600 mile pipeline to bring the uh, fracked gas from fracking fields in West Virginia to areas in Virginia and North Carolina. Construction of the pipeline was delayed by court challenges, yet Duke Energy kept spending $20 million a week on the pipeline because they thought the project would resume in the future. Total cost to energy consumers in North Carolina could have risen to $20 billion. New jobs and businesses that come to areas around the ACP based on the promise of cheap, abundant gas um, might not survive when fracking production begins to decline because usually um, the shale that is um, used to get the fracked gas dries up pretty quickly um, within a few years. Um, so those new jobs and businesses wouldn't be long lasting. And the industrial facilities that are located near pipelines cause toxic pollution, making the nearby frontline communities exposed to health, social, and economic hazards. A report by the NAACP says that low-income African Americans who live along the route of the ACP are at higher risk of illness compared to the general population, and living near the ACP and its associated energy facilities would make these health problems even worse. Communities near the ACP would have had a higher risk for chronic diseases like cancer, cardiovascular, and respiratory illness and birth defects. The closer the proximity to the pipeline, the higher the risk. Companies target and take advantage of these areas because they might not have to pay as much in transaction costs and they have a stronger ability to benefit from local government with their power, money, and resources. However, these communities also have a lot of people power and the ability to organize movements and coalitions and they are the main reason why the construction of the ACP was canceled in July of this year. So now I will pass it on to Valerie. Okay, so my subject is industry greed. Uh, industry greed has really conflicted with climate justice. Uh, this is the reason why climate justice includes ending corporate greed um, that has allowed industries like CAFOs, with their hog farms and the Duke Energy monopoly to exist as an environmental hazard. Um, these industries do not protect the health or well being of people. An article um, from The Guardian stated just 90 companies have produced nearly two thirds of the greenhouse emissions generated since the industrial age. Um, they tend to blame the public uh, for their expansion. Um, which is uh, an example of this would be um, suggesting that um, they can't switch, they can't convert to 
a more renewable energy energy source with the risk of um, their customers or consumers being displeased or unhappy, um, which is actually not as correct since they could make that shift um, and it would actually benefit the environment. Um, they tend to target lower, I mean, their waste tends to target low income communities, um, just like Duke Energy's proliferation um, and depositing waste into community, communities that they don't think have enough political power or dumping waste into um, into like coal ash, uh, like coal ash ponds, for example. And one of the reasons for um, the fact that they can't, they aren't really being held accountable is because of iron triangles in Congress, which uh, creates a pattern in which people can lobby and they can have, they have people coming in with political influence backing them, just like bank subsidies, like Bank of America is the third largest financer of oil, gas, and coal in the world. And it's, heav it's heavily involved in financing mountaintop removal of coal mining. Um, this is a reason that um, these corporations can't just drop out of um, their industries when they gain such power. And um, they want to keep getting more and more funding and greenwashing is a way they trick the public into seem, seeming like they're more environmentally conscious when in fact they're not. Um, now we have our second breakout groups. Yes, and I'm going to, I realize that once y'all go into the breakout groups, you can't see the chat. So I'm gonna leave this open for a second, um, just so that you can see the questions. I'll also put them in the broadcast text box once you're in there. Okay, so in this section, we're gonna be talking about some of the campaigns NC1 is involved with. So the first one is the Energy Justice NC. Mm -hmm. So EJNC is a coalition of local, state, and national groups that is anchored by leaders from communities most impacted by Duke's toxic coal ash, hot waste biogas, and worsening hurricanes caused in part by Duke's ongoing burning of coal and fracked natural gas. Um, so what percentage of Duke Energy's electricity do you think renewables are made up of? So I think there should be a poll. When the results come, can you share them aloud? Because I can't see them. <laughs> and for anyone else that might not be on their computer or whatever. We've got about 19 out of 25 responses, now 20. Um, so for the folks who haven't voted yet, if you want to go ahead and contribute to that, you can do so. We'll probably wrap up in another 30, 40 seconds. So most of you guys got it, it's 3%. And um, the other 90% actually comes from burning coal and fracked natural gas. So if you can click, um, there should be a visual. Yeah, so that's kind of a visual of that. And Duke Energy's monopoly controls over 95% of North Carolina's electricity customers. And this means that North Carolinians have to pay their electricity bill to Duke Energy no matter what unethical practices they choose to engage in. So Duke Energy ha has invested $3.5 billion in solar and wind energies in states where, it's, where it needs to compete for customers with other utilities that are prioritizing renewables as the path forward. But Duke's monopoly in North Carolina doesn't leave Duke competing for customers, which is why cheaper power plants are much more appealing than 
working in North Carolina solar companies. So EGNC has launched a vigorous statewide campaign to end Duke Energy's monopoly control of North Carolina's energy markets and public officials. And we actually have a petition that you can sign to endorse our campaign. So I will drop that in the chat box and I will pass it to Erica. Okay, so my name is Erica and the focus of my slide will be the North Carolina um, Clean Path 2025. And so the North Carolina Clean Path 2025 is an energy plan with the goal to achieve a clean and sustainable future by applying battery storage, solar power, and energy efficiency measures to replace fossil fuel generated electricity, one of the main drivers of climate change. By replacing these fossil fuels, it eliminates the toxic gases and instead lets out clean energy. And so NC Clean Path 2025 also provides jobs for thousands of people. And I will be passing it on to Trixie. Hi, uh, my name is Trixie. I use she, she, her pronouns, and I'm going to talk about the climate emergency declaration. So on May 13th, over 70 youth organizations, impacted communities, and other groups called for Governor Cooper to declare a climate emergency. Um, Governor Cooper would join more than 1,400 local and national governments, which have already declared this emergency. Um, in fact, Asheville was the first local government to declare a climate emergency. Um, and again, this call comes in response to the giant expansion of fracked gas projects that Duke Energy is in the process of building or has planned. Um, and Cooper, if he declares this, he has emergency management powers that can help him prevent harm instead of just responding to disasters. Specifically, a climate emergency declaration could help prohibit the further construction or expansion of fracked gas fired power generation facilities, pipelines like the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, compressor stations, and gas storage products projects. Um, and again, as we just saw with Hurricane Isaiah, um, Cooper has the power to declare this emergency because of repeated hurricanes, natural disasters, catastrophic flooding events that have become more prevalent in North Carolina over the past couple of years. So um, we have an action step for you guys today. On the right side of your screen, you can see this email template, and I will drop the link for this email template and the website. You can go to ncwarren.com and I will give everyone 30 seconds to do this. Um, you can scroll down and fill out your information in the blue box, which can send an email to Governor Cooper. Uh, please feel free to edit this message and add your voice, add your story, um, why you think that declaring this climate emergency is so important. And I will drop that link in the chat again, just in case anyone has any trouble finding it. change the slide in like 60 seconds give people a little bit of time to do that and if you have any questions feel free to drop it in the chat someone will get to you and answer your questions if you have any concerns Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and switch the slide, but for anyone who um, hasn't finished yet, just keep your window open and you can um, finish it up right as soon as we conclude with the webinar. Um, I'm Brianna, I use she, her pronouns. 
So in our series, we created materials to promote the um, emergency declaration campaign, and we specifically were targeting youth audiences with social media. Um, so this is some examples of the materials that we created. So there's a traditional infographic, a video, and some slides from an infographic from Instagram. So we learned that it's important to include information about the, like what you're promoting, but then also provide resources or actions to take afterward. Um, so the one has Governor Cooper's contact information, and then the other has a link with a petition to sign, and then an email and phone call template. Um, we also talked a lot about the importance of being informed, so knowing where your information is coming from, um, so to make sure it's a credible source, but especially with justice issues, making sure to put extra emphasis on impacted voices or those with firsthand experiences. Um, so especially now, there's a lot of information being spread on social media, um, which is really great and can be super informative. Um, but even if you don't see pre-existing information for an issue that you care about, um, resources like these are really easy to make yourself. Um, you can use programs like Canva or Infogram that are free and really simple to use. And then by encouraging your friends to share the same post, you can um, easily gain a lot of support for your campaign. Um, so if there's time, we're going to play like a minute or two of the video. Um, but then at the end, we're going to share a link tree with um, all of the resources that we made so you can look at them more. Climate change is an just let me know, Son, is the sound working? Issue concerned with the changes yes. in the globe climate patterns due to largely the emissions of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. This is an issue we are concerned about because of the multi-dimensional effects climate change has had on our communities in North Carolina. Hurricane Florence took North Carolina by surprise. Neighborhoods and streets were flooded with rainwater. Durham Public Schools were still requiring attendance due to a poor prediction of the hurricane's severity. There is still a good a lack of good drainage systems in North Carolina today, which leaves us unfit for the increase in hurricanes due to climate change. This increase in hurricanes is due to rising ocean temperatures. Climate change has also caused warming in North Carolina. In my lifetime, I have seen the average temperatures and seasons become higher every year, and the EPA has also seen That's the, uh, te the teaser, and um, you can see the full video later. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Meredith, and I, my pronouns are she, hers. So uh, in this section, I wanted to highlight uh, some of the positives and the progress that we've made and what we have the potential to do. Um, so on a more positive note, I guess, um, I wanted to highlight that Duke Energy um, right now has the option for um, doing solar not only as a more environmentally friendly um, source of energy rather than fossil fuels, it is also now officially cheaper for them to provide utilities that way. Um, and right now, as we said, they're operating on 3%. And they said in the next um, five, 10 years, I believe they wanna to transition to 8%, um, but that is obviously not um, a large enough scale. And it would lower costs and save uh, a lot of money for them and for consumers if they put in the money up front to transition to that. Um, so I, the main thing there is that it is cheaper. And hopefully that fact um, will grab their attention more than just the morals of it. Um, and particularly for our state, North Carolina has the potential to produce um, 30 times more energy based on the amount of solar energy we get with our weather than we use each year. Um, so that means that with solar energy, we can um, power our state if we put the infrastructure into that. And the other thing that we're pushing for, um, declaring clim a climate emergency, um, getting Governor Cooper to do that, 
it isn't something that would be inconvenient for him and it wouldn't be an unprecedented announcement for him to make. Um, many other countries and, and Asheville in our state, um, the town have declared climate emergencies. And once they do that, it gives them the ability to stop the further funding and construction of these harmful pipelines and fossil fuel companies. And it puts um, more power in his hands to um, prepare for hurricanes, rising temperatures, other things caused by climate change, rather than, as someone said earlier, um, having us in a constant state of disrepair, trying to fix things after a hurricane comes. Declaring a climate emergency will prepare us more for the coming changes that are going to occur with rising temperatures. And the graphic shows in our state, local solar and wind costs are less. And then the other picture shows some of the um, causes or the effects of um, hurricanes repeatedly hitting the coast. Um, and I'm Margot Franchini, and I'll, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be talking about what you can do to support more macro level efforts on um, to focus on um, making a just transition to a regenerative economy that prioritizes the health of the environment. Um, so the first thing you can do is support candidates from frontline communities. Frontline communities are any group whose local economy or culture or livelihood is directly affected by um, the effects or the proponents of climate change. So that could be like if they live near a, a toxic waste dump or if they're hit by the last hurricane. Um, they know what legislative actions need to be taken first, um, and they know how to prioritize the welfare of the most vulnerable, um, and which means they also have a unique and crucial perspective on the gravity of climate change that would be really helpful in government. Um, next thing you can do is research how incumbent candidates, which are candidates that are in office now and are, going, are running right now for office again in November, um, research how they voted on climate or energy legislation in the past. Um, you can find that information out online through news publications or various websites, including on the North Carolina General Assembly website, which I'll plug in the chat later, and um, just noting whether they voted against energy democracy or pro-unsustainable infrastructure, such as pipelines, um, anti-green initiatives, or pro-fossil fuels. Um, those are all red flags to look out for. Um, and kind of going along with that, um, also find out if your local representatives receive benefits from counterproductive corporations. Counterproductive meaning going against efforts to um, initiate a just transition. Um, and that information is a little more difficult to find, but um, one website is energyjusticenc.org. Follow the money, and I'll plug that in the chat too. Um, because we really don't want corruption in our government. And if um, one of your legislators is taking money from big oil companies or coal companies or even you know, Duke Energy, um, you might want to reevaluate how genuine their campaign promises are. Um, and the last thing is you can volunteer for a campaign. Um, it's a little difficult now, but you can still do things like phone banks. I just did one last night and it was pretty fun. And um, then there's also just online events where you can discuss is discuss discuss issues and um, talk about how you can do more community outreach. Um, I know a lot of you guys can't vote yet, um, but it's always important to educate yourself so that you can pass this information along to your family and friends. And also a lot of these legislators will still be there when it's your turn to vote next. So, yeah. And now I'll pass it over to Annabeth who's gonna talk about how you can vote. Hi guys, my name is Annabeth. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about voting. So in this coming election, every vote counts, especially in local elections. Um, so it's super important that we all know how to vote, uh, when to vote, and where to vote. So the first thing you can do is check if you're registered to vote. And you can do that by going to www.vote.org slash am I registered to vote or you can scan the QR code 
um, on the image on the right, and you can do that with your phone. Um, you can also go to youcanvote.org for things like voting guides, guides on how to vote by mail, where your polling place is, and just more stuff like that. Um, but if you can't vote yet because you're too young, um, you can still give this information to a friend to help them register. If you're 16 to 17 years old, you can pre-register and you can also pass along this information to family and friends. In addition to that, you can also take a picture of the slide or screenshot it so you can have that information for later. And now I'm going to pass it on to Ethan. Hi, my name is Ethan Ruderman and I use he, him pronouns. It is important that we not only educate ourselves on the climate injustices facing our world today, but we also take action to combat these issues. One very important way to educate others and keep this conversation going is to spread the word to family and friends. We urge you to have a discussion with at least one person not on the call to discuss the things you learned from this webinar. You can sum up everything you learned or just tell them your main takeaway. Whatever you can do to best spread the word. It is also important to not only spread the word, but to take decisive action against climate injustice. One way for you to take action is to sign the petition linked on the slide. This petition's goal is to end the Duke monopolies, control over our power grid, and make way for a new era of clean energy. The petition is already close to reaching its goal of 200 signatures, but with all of your help, I'm sure we can meet or even surpass that goal. There was another petition created by NC Warren with the same goal that got over 3,000 signatures, but we created a new one on change.org because it is easier to share via text or email or social media. While signing the petition, it will prompt you to share the link. We ask that you please do this so that the petition can achieve an even greater number of signatures and promote the message further. Another way to take action is to share the link to the virtual postcard from earlier in the webinar with friends and family. The postcard urges Governor Cooper to declare a state of emergency in North Carolina due to the ever-growing climate crisis. Citizen action such as postcards and petitions has been effective in the past. An example of this is the cancellation of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. The activism that took place against the ACP greatly contributed to its cancellation, so it can also help sway Cooper to declare a state of emergency. All of us at NC Warren urge you to follow these action steps in order to build a cleaner, healthier planet for all of us and for all of the future generations that will follow. And Annabelle, before you speak to the link tree, I realize I didn't actually assign someone to this of just letting y'all know if there's something you want to share in these last few minutes um, from an initiative, um, a group that you're in. I know there might be someone from the Triangle Youth Climate um, Collective on the call. So this would be a time that if anyone wants to share work that they've been doing in this realm, um, go ahead, either you can go off mute or put it in the chat box um, and then Annabeth is gonna uh, give us the link tree at the very end. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks, Grace. Uh, thank you so much. We really enjoyed um, this webinar. Um, I'm Allie, and Natasha and I are the co-founders of the Triangle Youth Climate Collective. And we formed this collective because we really hope to improve communication between um, individuals interested in climate change and climate activism groups and in between like different climate activism groups so that we can improve communication and youth involvement in climate activism. Yeah, and so Ali and I were both involved in organizing the virtual climate live streams in April and soon realized that there were not enough youth groups involved. Moreover, people interested in getting involved did not know how to do so. So as aforementioned, we aim to get more students involved in climate activism and increase our presence in events and planning. So, so far we've created a WhatsApp group chat and we hope that any youth interested in climate activism or already involved will join us so that we can um, communicate effectively 
um, on our, what our future plans are. Yeah, and so we also have an Instagram account at Zero Hour Triangle, which would be great if you could, uh, if you could follow to see updates and ways to get involved. Yeah, and if it's all right, um, I'll send something out in the chat about how you can contact us and um, join us so that we can hopefully improve more uh, communication and increase larger scale uh, climate activism for you. Thanks so much for sharing that, y'all. Um, is there anyone else before we wrap up with the link tree? I have something I'd like to share, or um, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, I'm Ainsley. I'm the executive director of a student-led nonprofit that's called the Student Environmental Education Coalition. And so our mission is basically to promote environmental literacy by empowering youth to become leaders in the environmental movement. And branches of our organization exist primarily at high schools in the Triangle area of North Carolina, like the School of Science and Math and East Chapel High School, Chapel High School, or INLO. Um, so if you're at any of the schools, please look into our organization. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about our work, just visit our website. I'll um, chat the link out in a second. And if you're a high school student who might be interested in starting up a branch at our school or at your school, um, just feel free to use the contact us feature on our website and we'll get in contact with you about like what that would entail and what sort of things um, we can help you accomplish um, through establishing a branch at your high school of SEEK. So I'll chat out the link. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I am I'm creating a chapter for Earth Uprising in Chapel Hill, um, which would kind of serve the triangle um, since there's no other chapters around. Um, and it's kind of in the works right now, but I there is an Instagram account and I'll be launching um, the invitation to join soon. Um, the Instagram account is Earth Uprising Chapel Hill, and it's for any youth who want to engage with national and international, and also will be creating local campaigns um, just to save the planet and to advocate for environmental justice too. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um... And then uh, Mia and I are also part of the um, Youth uh, Climate Justice Initiative. Um, we partner with NC Warren um, to give a voice to um, youth who are affected by um, climate change or um, just like minority communities who don't often have a voice um, and youth. So. I will uh, drop my number in the chat. And if anyone's interested in joining us um, or coming to any of our climate conversations, um, yeah, text me. Awesome. Any questions folks had as we wrap up here? And Annabeth, did you have the link tree to post? We'll also send this out in an email though, because I know there have been a lot of links dropped. <laughs> yeah, I just posted it in the chat. It has NC Warren social media, um, links to the website and different campaigns and stuff. So lots of useful information in there. Awesome, yay. Thanks to our wonderful youth. Um, it's been really amazing to lead the summer series for the first time with such a great group. So appreciations to y'all um, and appreciation to all of you for joining us.